my talk today is talking about planetary atmospheres and planetary interiors and the connection between them. Uh, so um, this is really what you might call a statistical view of planetary physics. A lot of times in planets, we talk about the physics of particular objects or try to make connections between two or three objects. This is really about trying to make connections between a large number of objects. We've already heard about that a little bit this morning, things about the radius valley. How can we explain that by looking at a collection of planets? So this is a, a statistical view. It's um, typically, I would say, a bit easier when you're thinking about planetary structure rather than talking about planetary atmospheres. Because for planetary structure, it's typically a little bit less demanding. You might only need to measure a planet's mass and radius, learn something about its density. You might have dozens or hundreds of objects where you know the densities. Whereas for uh, planetary atmospheres, you might want to get spectra of those objects. It's a lot more time consuming and harder to get spectra of dozens or hundreds of objects. We'll certainly get there. Um, so uh, today's talk is really about some findings we have for planetary structure. I want to talk about two topics and how we can extend those to learn something about planetary atmospheres. So uh, the first half of the talk is thinking about these cold, colder transiting giant planets. This is, like, again, work led by Daniel. This is planet radius in Jupiter radii. This is like the solar constant. And for planets cooler than about 1,000 degrees, we can see these objects are not anomalously inflated. This dashed red curve would be a naive expectation for the radius of these planets. The hottest of the hot Jupiters tend to be the most inflated. But if you look at these cooler objects out here, there's about 50 objects. Actually, now it's up to about 75, I think. Um, we can measure their mass, their radius, we can infer their density, and we can run a structure model to infer something about the metal enrichment of the planet. So these objects are all smaller and denser than pure hydrogen helium objects. You can infer something about their metallicity, the amount of heavy elements or metals inside of them. And so Daniel's done this in a fully Bayesian way by running many thousands of models per planet. Just for instance, you can look at something like WASP-8, we can infer inside that planet there's something like 80 Earth masses of heavy elements with a distribution around that. Uh, the details of the colors aren't particularly important. We don't really know if the heavy elements are mostly in a core or mostly in the envelope or some sort of di uh, distribution between the two of them. We can do this for about 50 planets. Here's just four for four examples. And we can derive this sort of relation. This was published about three years ago now. Uh, this is the inferred heavy element mass inside of a planet in Earth masses. Again, this is from a structure model of the planet versus planet mass. You can find something that is pretty interesting, I think, in that there's good evidence that nine planets have to have on the order of something like 10 Earth masses of heavy elements inside them, which agrees quite well with the expectations from the core accretion model of planet formation. Then as you get to larger and larger planet masses, you're accreting not just hydrogen and helium, you're also accreting significant additional metals as well. So these objects are not just hydrogen and helium spheres with a small core. These objects are typically accreting tens or even hundreds of Earth mass heavy elements at the same time they're accreting hydrogen and helium. So these objects are quite metal enriched. Uh, and then Jupiter and Saturn there are sitting there amongst their cousin planets looking very nicely within the distribution. We can make a diagram like this. This is the planet, the metals mass fraction of the planet, again from the structure model, compared to Z star. That's from measuring the iron abundance of the parent star, Z star. We can look at the metal enrichment of the planet as a function of planet mass. This is just another way of showing the same data set. You can see there's a characteristic slope and a characteristic spread. To me, the spread is as important as the slope in that there's no one way of making a giant planet. If you look at Saturn mass planets, there's less metal enriched set Saturns, there's very metal enriched Saturn. There's a big diversity at a given planet mass. This is entirely complementary to what people are doing for atmospheres. So on the left is the exact same plot I just showed, Z planet over Z star. On the right is a, a diagram people have been working very hard to add additional planets to. This is again planet mass in Jupiter masses. This is the uh, implied atmospheric metallicity in solar abundances. We have the solar system's four gas giants, where this is measuring the methane abundance, so to infer carbon, comparing to the water abundance in a variety of transiting planets. And so the point I want to make of the first half of the talk is already on the left-hand side, you can see there's a large spread, although there is a slope you can see. On the right-hand side, we don't really have enough objects yet to say that, because we're looking at a sample size of something like eight, not a sample size of 50. But I'm, I would expect the spread over here to be larger. And that's for two reasons. One is that there's going to be a, certainly a diversity in sharing these metals between the core and the envelope. And that's, that's going to increase the spread. If on the right-hand side, we don't know the fraction of metals that are in the envelope, 
versus the core. And there's probably going to be a diversity in that because we think, for instance, Jupiter, perhaps most of its metals are in the envelope, whereas Saturn, we think most of its metals are in the core. That's going to lead to some bigger spread. So we should expect a bigger spread on the right, I think. Also, we have some apples to oranges effects here, right? So uh, in the solar system, we're measuring the carbon abundance. And on the right over here, we're measuring some fraction of the oxygen abundance. We're seeing what's, what's in water. And that's what you might call apples to oranges. I was reading a book uh, about some other topic, and it talked about um, when you think you're comparing apples to oranges, make sure you're not really comparing apples to Buicks. <laughs> and, and boy, that really stopped me in my tracks for a long time. Um, I think when we're thinking about carbon and oxygen, it really is apples to oranges, it's not apples to Buicks. Um, but we should be mindful that this diagram on the right is really good. It's going to, I think it's going to be messier than the one on the left because there's a lot more physical effects going on. So for the second half of my talk, I want to think about the objects on the far right-hand side. These are the uh, anomalously inflated hot Jupiters. This has been a long-standing problem going back uh, 20 years now. Um, uh, where we have a sample of over 200 planets here, and the typical object is larger and less dense than the expectation of a naive model in red. So we can think about what this implies for the structure of planetary atmospheres. Uh, this is a lot of text, but on the right-hand side, I just want to show that for a long time, people have been modeling the structure of exoplanet atmospheres for these strongly radiated planets. This is pressure versus temperature from Sadarsky et al. 2003. And this is a, a four models that all have the same parent star, but these are interiors that are cooling off over time. If you have a young planet with a hot intrinsic temperature, you get a shallower radiative convective boundary. And as the interior cools off to smaller and smaller fluxes, uh, you have a, a, a stronger mismatch between the incident flux and the intrinsic flux, and your radiative convective boundary would get deeper and deeper and deeper. And so if you look at Jupiter itself, Jupiter's intrinsic temperature is on the order of 100 Kelvin. And if you put that around uh, in a five-day orbit around a parent star, you naturally get a radiative convective boundary at like one kilobar. That's down here, 10 to the three bars. Also, if you run a simple cooling model of a transiting planet, you find the interior of your hot Jupiter should cool off to around about 100 Kelvin, and that you should get at giga-year ages uh, a radiative convective boundary at around one kilobar. And that's been a number that's been thrown around for a long time. Um, in principle, though, we know this is probably not really correct in that if you have a very large radius planet that's like 1.5 Jupiter radii, that implies the interior is hot and low density. That implies there's a lot of flux coming out of the interior. And so that implies that these models with hotter interiors are probably closer to reality in these models with cooler interiors. So people have, who have modeled 1D and three-dimensional models have sometimes thought of this as a free parameter, running hot interiors, running cold interiors. But there hasn't really been any sort of kind of rule of thumb people have used for what's actually realistic. And so the radio convective boundary is often ignored or is left as a free parameter. But as I said, these structure models actually can suggest what is a realistic intrinsic flux coming out of the interior in a realistic radiative convective boundary. Uh, so the goal then is to use the radius distribution of all of these planets, it's over 300 objects, to infer something about the hot Jupiter population. And so what that is, is to assess the needed inflation power to explain the radius of these planets. This is a paper Daniel and I did last year, where we're trying to figure out what, if, if you imagine what's causing hot Jupiter inflation is some anomalous heating from the parent star getting its way into the planet's deep interior, what fraction of that energy do you need it to do? And so it's something on the order of a few percent. It starts out small because the colder hot Jupiters are not inflated. Then you get up to objects at around 1,500 K that are really inflated. Then it actually has to go down again. So it looks like this kind of quasi-Gaussian shape. And that's for the heating efficiency. What we're doing now is recasting that in terms of what the intrinsic flux coming out of the interior is, which is parameterized by some temperature. It also looks something like a quasi-Gaussian in that it peaks at around something like 700 Kelvin. Uh, so 700 to the fourth compared to 100 to the fourth is a difference of about 2,400. So a factor in the flux coming out of the interior over 2,000 times higher than if you just use Jupiter's intrinsic flux, which is around 100 degrees. And so what that does is it dramatically changes the structure of your atmosphere. 
And so uh, uh, what we've done with Peter Gao in the past few months is compute a series of models where we're looking at different distances from, a, from the sun, 0.1 AU, 0.01 AU up to 0.1 AU, using this, this, this derived law for the flux coming out of the interior. And so we typically find radiative convective boundaries that are not at a kilobar, but radiative convective boundaries that are typically at um, something like a bar or so. These are all, I think, Saturn-type gravities with a slightly metal-enriched atmosphere. So the typical hot Jupiters then have radio convective boundaries at a few bars. And it's only once you get to the cooler and cooler objects where there's much less flux coming out of the interior that you get these deep radiative convective boundaries at around um, several hundred bars. I should mention the thick curves are convective, the thin curves are radiative. And this has a number of important implications, which I'll show on the next slide. But one here visually is you can see if you have a condensation curve where a cloud might be forming, like Forsterites, if you have a, uh, a shallow rate of convective zone, the cloud might form at a bar. Whereas if you have a deep rate of convective zone, you'd follow this dotted curve and your cloud might actually be at 500 bars. So clouds and the height at which they form is one particularly important uh, aspect. So we can compute then what the radiative convective boundary would be in pressure as a function of the incident flux for different gravities, different metallicities. And you can see typically then for the typical hot Jupiters, you're at something like a few bars, whereas it gets deeper as you get to cooler planets where there's much less flux coming out of the interior. So the implications then I think are pretty interesting. So uh, just the, the first bullet point of what I've repeated several times now. This is potentially important for a number of things. One would be uh, the day-night circulation. What is the, bound of butter? What is the bottom boundary in your three-dimensional model? Um, is it just a radiative atmosphere all the way down to essentially infinity? Or if you have a convection actually happening just below the visible atmosphere? Another is for interpreting observed phase curves. If your night side of your planet actually has a fair amount of convective flux coming out that you uh, weren't accounting for before that might make one way of making night sides a bit hotter than you typically might think. Another is vertical mixing. We've tend to thought about hot Jupiter atmospheres as being radiative down to an extremely deep depth. But if they're actually convective down below a few bars, that's one way of keeping particulates quite a bit higher up in the atmosphere. Another is, is related, these deep cold traps. People have thought about how cold traps deep in the atmosphere might trap materials. Um, and condensates down in the atmosphere, but if the atmosphere is actually hot and convective, these things might get wafted up more easily. So my second to last slide is, is there any direct observational tests for this? So uh, we can compute models with different temperature interiors, 700K, 400K, 200, 100. We can calculate the pressure that we see down to as a function of wavelength. It's typically around maybe a tenth of a bar, but it varies very strongly with wavelength. In the JHK windows, that's where we see the deepest, where the opacity is at the minimum. And we might be able to actually see enhanced fluxes in the near infrared, this blue curve compared to the red curve, um, for a hot interior of like 700K. That's a project I'm working on right now. So to summarize then, uh, we should expect, I think, a mass metallicity relation for giant planets. I think it's going to be messier in terms of atmospheric abundances than it will be for the actual structure of the planets. And uh, we have some new results on the radiative convective boundary depth, which we think is a lot shallower than most people have suggested in the past. Thanks a lot. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I see a couple of questions. We don't have much time. Uh, over there in the top. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, the lady second. Hi, Hannah Wakeford, Space Telescope. Um, a lot of the implications that you listed seem to produce more clouds. Is there a testable prediction on ratios of planets that we find with clouds there? Uh, so sh should we see uh, like the fraction of planets that would be cloudy yeah. versus not cloudy? Um, yeah, so Peter Gao has a paper that, that he's leading that we just submitted to Nature Astronomy that tries to look at the transmission spectra in, 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 in Hubble, a wide field camera three, the cloudiness as a function of, of planetary temperature. And so one of the things Peter finds is that we can only fit this trend of cloudiness versus wavelength with these um, higher rated convective boundaries. If the boundaries are much deeper, um, he finds cloudiness versus wavelength that doesn't actually fit observations. So that's another nice observational test. 
Okay, we are really short on time, but uh, there's one question from Sandro and Eric. Hilke Schlichting, UCLA. Um, a very interesting talk. I'm curious, does that does the shallower rate of convective boundaries help you in terms of explaining the inflated hot Jupiters? Because it would make it easier to um, put yeah. the heat back inside. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, any inflated object, no matter what the mechanism is, has to have a shallower rate of convective boundary. And so it might make some mechanisms like ohm anticipation a bit easier to do in that you don't need to get the energy down really deep. Um, so that's something that we're thinking about as well in the next year. Thanks. Is it a short question? Yeah. <laughs> John, uh, Eric Guy, that's University of Hawaii. Where do you assume that the energy is deposited and does that matter? Uh, Ted Komachek has an entire paper on this. So uh, in our models, we're assuming that the energy is uh, deposited within the convective interior. Um, but it does matter a lot. If you're putting it into the deep radiative atmosphere, you need a lot more energy. Yeah, good point. I have to, I have to allow one more question. Because Chris and um, so please thank you for asking the CEA Paris Saclay. So what sort of implications do you think this has for the long-term evolution of the planet? Because you're looking at an interior flux that's going to come from a core collapse in sort of cooling towards that. So where's the energy for this coming from? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think the I think the planets are essentially in, in a steady state. Their interiors are not cooling. The planets are not contracting. Um, uh, there's you know there's as you well know there's a, a variety of perhaps a dozen dynamical mechanisms where people are trying to get energy from the parent star some small fraction of that into the convective interior. Um, I'm trying to be agnostic about what I think the mechanism is, but I think it does make it easier for a lot of these dynamical mechanisms if people have to only get the energy down to a few bars rather than a kilobar. Okay, we have to postpone everything else into coffee breaks. Um, thank you very much. All right,